strives to promote freedom, federalism, and the rule of law, and we do so through facilitating debate and discussion within the law school community. Today our chapter is thrilled to be co-hosted with the Asian Law Students Association, um, a debate on uh, for adoption and its on Asian American and Africans. Hi, I'm Paige Chung. I'm here representing the Asian Law Student Association. We are a community here for Asian law students to come together and to celebrate our goals together. We are very pleased to be co-hosting with FedSong today. I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers um, this afternoon. Uh, we have Professor Sanford Levinson with us this um, afternoon. Yeah, frankly, afternoon, yeah. Um, Professor Sanford Levinson, uh, who holds the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair in Law, joined the University of Texas Law School in 1980. Previously a member of the Department of Politics at Princeton University, he is also a professor in the Department of Government at the University of Texas. Professor Levinson is the author of approximately 400 articles, book reviews, or commentaries in professional and popular journals, and a regular contributor to the popular blog, Balkanization. He has also written six books and edited many more, including Your Constitutional Law Facebook. He received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Law and Courts section of the American Political Science Association in 2010. We also have with us Corey Liu. Corey Liu is an associate at Reynolds Frizzell LLP in, in Houston and the volunteer executive director of Students for Fair Admissions. Corey is a cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School and he received his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago with honors. During law school, he gained invaluable experience clerking for the Texas Solicitor General's Office and working for Justice Don Willett on the Texas Supreme Court. After law school, he served as law clerk for Judge Danny J. Boggs on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Please help me in welcoming our speakers. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Corey Liu and I serve as the Volunteer Executive Director of Students for Fair Admissions. And we are the nonprofit organization. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated uh, to racial equality, and we are the organization bringing the lawsuit against Harvard and the University of Texas, challenging the constitutionality of their use of race uh, and racial discrimination in their admissions decisions. So how did I get involved in this issue? Uh, well, it all started here in Austin. Uh, I was born and raised in Austin, and my parents came from China uh, in 1987. They grew up under the worst of communism. Uh, during the Great Leap Forward, the government took complete control of the economy, and they promised that they would end starvation, everyone would have enough food to eat, but the reality at the end of the day was that people were starving, they were eating grass and tree bark, tens of millions of people starved to death. And then during the Cultural Revolution, there was no freedom of speech, no freedom of association, no freedom of religion. Uh, the Red Guard shut down the schools, universities were closed. Rather than going to college, my dad was sent to the countryside to do years of hard labor and learn from the peasants, as they said. Uh, he stole the works of Shakespeare from the book-burning piles and read them in secret uh, before his dad took them away and put them back in the book-burning piles where they belonged in order to protect his family. And so uh, they came here as immigrants. Uh, after the colleges reopened, my dad was able to uh, go to school. He got his PhD and uh, turned that into an opportunity when uh, a professor from the University of Texas uh, was visiting in Germany and they had a conversation and he got to do his postdoc here at UT Austin and that's how they came here. And they were supposed to go back to China after a while, uh, but because of the massacre in Beijing that happened in 1989, uh, President George H.W. Bush and Congress gave green cards, permanent residency, to the Chinese students who were here. Uh, and so that is how they got here. And uh, you know, when they moved here, they didn't have much. Uh, like many immigrants, they had to work their way up from the bottom, and they didn't have that many connections or uh, wealth. My mom actually worked at the uh, Jester Center cafeteria here at UT, serving students like yourself. And she saved up her money to go to community college to get her associate's degree in computer programming and work at the Texas Department of Insurance and now TEA. And like so many immigrant parents, uh, her dream was that her uh, kids would have a better opportunity uh, than she did growing up. And uh, that's the dream, right? 
And education is the key to climbing the ladder of opportunity and, and working your way up. Uh, you have to go to college and, and get a good education, uh, which of course all of you have done now uh, going, in, going to law school. Uh, you know, growing up as the son of immigrants uh, in Austin was not easy. I looked up online last night, and I think uh, in 1990, the Asian population in Austin was about 3%. And if you were to break that down to the Chinese, it might be like 1% or so. Um, so certainly growing up, uh, there were times when I felt uh, out of place or like I didn't belong. Um, and you know, the, the movie Black Panther just came out recently. And uh, I've seen it twice, it's a great movie. And uh, what is so wonderful about it is that it shows uh, African Americans and not just as caricatures or stereotypes of what some white writer in Hollywood uh, thought of them as kind of a joke, but as real human beings, the heroes, uh, the lovers, the scientists, uh, the full range of what it means to be human. And I will say, as Asians, we, we haven't quite had that yet, uh, but I could certainly understand uh, that feeling of watching the movie and, and the person who looks like you is not really someone you can identify with or, or that you want to you know, aspire to be like, right? My favorite movie, growing up was uh, Jurassic Park. And I remember the one Asian guy in the movie was the scientist, and, and you know, that's one of the tropes, right? Either the word foreigner or the scientist or something. He's like, yes, the dinosaurs all have two X chromosomes, so they're all female, and they cannot breathe. Uh, and so all of this has been to say that Asian Americans still face discrimination to this day, and there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, even as a lawyer representing corporate clients, I've had uh, this former CEO of a Fortune 500 company uh, try to joke, I guess, and ask me whether I had my work papers. Uh, so Asian Americans face discrimination uh, as racial minorities, and unfortunately, uh, in our system today, they face yet another form of discrimination that's institutionalized legal discrimination and from universities when they're applying to college. Uh, and that's through the policy that is commonly known as race-based affirmative action. So the way it works is when you apply to college and when you apply to law school, they ask you to self-identify your race. Uh, it's usually white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American. Some of them are now breaking them down into smaller groups. But they want you to self-identify, and they'll look at that, and also you know, what your name looks, not, looks like, uh, whether it seems ethnic and your uh, essays. Sometimes they invite you to talk about your, your identity and your background and then also just your extracurricular activities and, and all the other things they can see from your application. And then based on your race, they're going to treat you differently in the application process. Uh, the idea behind it is that they want certain, a certain look to the student body that comes into the class, right? And they want a representation uh, of certain groups. And if certain groups are underrepresented, then they will show preferences to those students on account of their race to reach a certain level uh, of population in the student body. And that's often talked about, but what's not talked about usually in the debates and in the court decisions and in the media uh, until just starting recently is that, sure, you're, you're giving an advantage to underrepresented groups, but there's also this consequence of where certain groups are overrepresented, particularly Asians. Uh, white students actually uh, are underrepresented. They're just not a minority group. But uh, Asians, because they're overrepresented, uh, schools apply a higher standard for admission to them. Uh, there have been newspaper interviews, you know, uh, Boston Globe, etc., of uh, former admissions officers who will just, they're just telling the truth of how it works, that you're compared against people of the same race, and so if you're Asian, and uh, you're going to be expected to have grades and test scores similar to other Asians or better, and if you, if you don't reach that, then there's no chance uh, of you getting in. Um, uh, there have been numbers and studies showing this. Uh, the most commonly cited one is by Professor Thomas Espenshade uh, and Alexandria Radford. And they looked at elite universities. They were at Princeton, um, but they looked at a number of other elite universities. And they found that uh, Asians, even compared to white students, uh, just looking at race alone, had a disadvantage that equals to about 140 points uh, on a 1600 SAT scale. 140 points, that's just whites and Asians. And it was, I think, 270 for Hispanics uh, and 450 when comparing Asians uh, to black students. Um, here at UT, uh, when this case, the Fisher case went to the Supreme Court in 2013, Justice Thomas also cited uh, statistics about who was admitted to college. The numbers weren't quite as big, but I, I believe there was a 77-point SAT difference on the 2400 scale between Asian and white students and uh, a greater 
difference between Asians and black and Hispanic students. Um, so uh, yeah, just talking from my personal experience, uh, growing up here in Austin, one of my, one of my classmates, uh, he was Indian and the son of immigrants. And uh, you know, very modest means. Uh, he had a perfect SAT, a perfect ACT, and his only sin was that he was an Asian male who wanted to be a doctor. And so he dreamed of going to an Ivy League school, and he got rejected from all of the ones that he applied to. And actually, a reporter from the Austin American Statesman interviewed him, and the title of the article was, Perfect is Not Good Enough in Increasingly Competitive Admissions Process, but there was no discussion of race. And of course, it, it was just hard to miss the elephant in the room, because you know that if he had had those perfect, sort of, he literally did the best that he could possibly have done in his situation, and worked and, and to try to excel, but that still wasn't good enough for these schools. And you know that if you checked a different racial box, uh, the outcome could be very different. You see these articles about how you know student accepted to all of the Ivy League schools, right? And that's uh, just one anecdotal piece of evidence of how uh, these policies have a negative effect on Asian Americans. Um, so I guess one of the counter arguments that you'll hear from uh, supporters of these policies is that they're necessary to give a helping hand to people who are disadvantaged. But I guess my response to that is, uh, then why don't you use actual questions that look at individual personal disadvantage rather than your racial group? I'm not sitting here saying that every school needs to admit students based solely on SAT, solely on GPA. Uh, I actually think you know different schools might have different ways they want to uh, run their institutions. I think uh, there's many competing philosophies about what a university should do. All I'm saying is that of all the factors you could look at, race should not be one of them. Because that's prohibited by law and that's against our constitution. Uh, and so you could ask questions like, what's your family's income? Uh, did you lose a parent? Like, how much money uh, do you have available just in savings from your parents uh, for you to go to school? Were you ever in the foster care system? Right? These are questions that do not take into consideration of uh, your race and yet actually look at individually, personally, what disadvantages have you gone through, and that means students who are white or Asian who also had disadvantage uh, could, could possibly benefit from such a policy. And of course we know that's true. I mean, there are white and Asian students who have, have come from very modest means and have suffered and have overcome enormous hardship, and there are also uh, black and Hispanic students who have uh, had above average opportunities. I mean, think of The Rock, who, at least when I first started giving these talks, was the highest paid actor in America. It's now the Diesel. Uh, but, you know, his, he's a millionaire. He's famous. His kids uh, have every, certainly every material opportunity and uh, social connections, all that that comes with fame. Uh, or even, I don't know, Donald Trump's kids, right? I mean, under the current policies, racially, they would be more desirable than the Asian immigrant. Uh, how do you justify that? I don't think you can. Uh, you know, just looking in the room today, I see uh, dozens of Asian Americans who have heard about this event, and uh, they are concerned citizens. They've been waiting to hear this talk for weeks because it's something that affects their families. It affects their children. And I don't know how this university can look at them in the eye and say that their children deserve less opportunity, uh, less of a chance to go to the school of their dreams, even though they're immigrants and they face discrimination, similar, simply because their group as a whole is overrepresented in the eyes of the university. So if you want to look, if you want to give a helping hand uh, to people who are disadvantaged, you can do it in a way that doesn't discriminate based on race. You can do it in a way that's actually individually focused on, on what disadvantage uh, you've gone through. Uh, another response that you hear from universities like UT and Harvard is just to flat out deny that there's any discrimination. This is usually what they do in court because of course that's what lawyers do. They, they, they have to fight the battle they don't want to lose. Um, uh, it's not true, but what they say is, look, admissions is not just about test scores and grades. So yes, you cite these disparities uh, and you're trying to say there's discrimination, but it's a fair process because we look at the whole package. It's a complete package, right? All of the attributes, and that means not just your grades and test scores, but your extracurricular activities, your leadership potential, along with you know, your personal disadvantage. Uh, but we look at everything. And once you take into that holistic uh, package, 
Everyone's treated as an individual. And I guess my response to that is, uh, are you saying that year after year, Asian Americans are somehow deficient in these characteristics, that they don't have leadership potential, that they don't do extracurricular activities, that once you look at anything other than grades and test scores, they, they're always uh, falling behind? Such that, for example, at Harvard, they cap the number of Asians at roughly 17% every year. I mean, that's just simply not true. They're invoking the same racist and bigoted stereotype that Hollywood does of Asians, uh, that is what happened to my classmate in high school, which is that, look, we've got too many of these Asians, especially in, in medicine and science. Heaven forbid we have another one of those guys in Jurassic Park who's turning the dinosaur egg. We don't need any more of these Asian kids who are good at school, right? And those are the same sorts of arguments that were made uh, about the Jews in the early 1900s at Harvard, uh, where they wanted to put a cap on the number of Jews because they thought that these are people who were really good at, at academics, but they just didn't fit in socially, and they were kind of insular, and so we don't like them. And so for the, for the well-being of the social climate and, and the, the, the feel of the school, we want to use these holistic factors um, uh, in the admissions decision. Uh, so what we're doing now is we're arguing under the state constitution uh, at UT, in UT um, that the use of race flat out is unconstitutional. Uh, this has never been brought before in state court, so we're looking forward to it. And I'll close just by saying that, uh, you know, uh, the year before I applied to college, uh, President Barack Obama came to Austin. He came to Auditorium Shores, and my teacher was nice enough to let me go uh, listen to him speak, and he talked about the history of injustice in Southern Illinois and the racial discrimination. But that he was inspired when he went there and he was campaigning. And he saw that there were white people and black people embracing his campaign. And he quoted Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as saying that the arc of the, uh, the, arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And so that's what we're trying to do today. We're fighting for justice. We're fighting for racial equality so everyone can be treated equally. We're fighting for Dr. King's dream that his four little children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. When you apply to college, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter where your family is from, to quote The Rock. It doesn't matter what your name is. It doesn't matter whether it's Smith or Jones or Hernandez or Chang or Patel. That shouldn't affect your educational destiny. We're all Americans, we're all equal citizens, and we're all entitled to equal rights. And so finally, I'll make just a plug. If you know someone who was rejected from UT Austin this year, you can go to studentsforfairadmissions.org or reach out to me on social media. We always welcome new members, and that's how we're able to bring this lawsuit. And uh, it's a tangible way in which ordinary people can make an impact in their community. So uh, thank you. I view this much more as a discussion as a debate. I think this is a very strong and eloquent suit, um, not least because there is the analogy to A. Lawrence Lowell and the policies of Harvard in the 19-teens and 1920s, um, which were, to put it mildly, unattractive in the arguments that were made then. Um, there are, so I want to toss out various questions rather than really make a full-scale argument. One question really is the irony of the way the federal society introduced itself, because we're really not talking about um, federalism in particular, or about local control, or even liberty in a way. We're talking about the extent to which there should be a single national policy imposed ultimately by the Supreme Court on every educational institution. Um, my view is that the Supreme Court really knows very little about the way educational institutions work. Um, and um, I would distinguish actually between UT and Harvard, um, which does not necessarily mean that I want to defend Harvard's policy, but it does seem to me that private universities um, have 
freedoms to select their student bodies along a variety of criteria, some of which I would agree with, some of which I wouldn't. And the easy examples are religious universities, but it's easy enough, obviously, to distinguish between ethnicity and religion. So I don't want to push that very hard, but it's very clear that you know, UT can't have the same admissions policies Notre Dame, and one would not wish, or I would not wish to read the Constitution to make it impossible for Notre Dame to prefer Catholics. Uh, either admissions or appointments, their, their mission and the like. Uh, but that's kind of a, a cheap point because in some ways, I'm not sure, you know, I really want to focus only on the law. I think there is very little merit to the argument that the Constitution correctly understood requires colorblindness, which is the argument that you're making. That certainly doesn't fit, I think, the history of the 14th Amendment. Um, and I don't think it fits with necessarily the best theory of the 14th Amendment. Um, uh, Justice Harlan suggested it in his Plessy dissent and certainly picked up by a number of lawyers since then, but it's important that the Supreme Court has never actually endorsed it for a very good reason. Um, and you know, we can talk about when race or ethnicity or religion might be relevant and when it's not. So, you know, frankly, I tend to doubt that there's a single fair way of admitting people to universities or allocating any other scarce goods. Uh, the most important affirmative action program at the University of Texas is the state resident affirmative action program. It is easier to get, we, in fact, we have a quota. It's not even a goal. I don't, I'm not sure what the current quota is uh, for the law school. It was 80 percent. 65 percent. 65 percent. So not only is there an advantage to any Texans who apply, but as many of you know, there are hefty financial differences between in-state and out-of-state students. Uh, and I think, you know, frankly, it's not the easiest thing in the world to defend. I can present a constitutional argument based on the Privilege and Immunities Clause um, that it is unconstitutional for states to discriminate in favor of their own residents against residents of other states that are part of the Union. That argument has been rejected, but as I say, at the end of the day, um, I find a lot of the legal arguments just um, frustrating or unsatisfying, partly because um, I think what is pushing them are political and moral theories rather than you know, the one true theory of what the law, independently of your moral or political views, might suggest. So, you know, we look at Justice Thomas's opinion in, 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 I forget whether it's Gratz or Grutter, it doesn't matter, where what he says is that universities are free to discriminate on all sorts of legacy admissions. That doesn't bother um, Justice Thomas, but it should. He agrees that universities can prefer cellists to violinists if they're trying to figure out how to make sure the university orchestra um, you know, can continue to operate because they need cellists even if under some theory the violinists are better as violinists than the cellists are as cellists or as oboists or bassoonists. That's really quite irrelevant if you're trying to think of an orchestra. We talk about sports analogies um, where you're going to need people to play all sorts of positions. So the real problem to which I have no solution at all, is that universities are trying to create um, collectivities of individuals who are supposed to contribute to some overall beneficial experience. This is all vague and not very helpful, but the, you know, the argument for diversity, and I've been publicly critical of the way diversity arguments work in most universities. Um, I think we talk about diversity the way we do only because the Supreme Court, which has never come close 
to offering a cogent theory of diversity. Um, in Bakke and thereafter, it is said, well, diversity is legitimate in a way that rectifying past social injustice is not. My own view is that if you look at university admissions policies, especially at a variety of state universities, including the University of Texas, what we're trying to do is to rectify past social injustice, but, the, but uh, more than achieve some idealized notion of diversity. But the Supreme Court has said we can't be candid. We can't be honest. So we talk about diversity without having a truly cogent theory of diversity. I think that's true of all universities. Um, I think it's also true at universities and elsewhere that we're interested in the general political demographics so that it is simply an important aspect about Texas that the future political leadership, whether it's next year or 20 years from now, is going to be substantially more Hispanic than it now is. And can a university, can the, can the LBJ school, for example, which is concerned with educating, preparing cadres of leadership for the future, can the LBJ school take into account this very, very important demographic fact about the future of Texas? Um, the Supreme Court won't let us talk about this way. These are the way I think we talk in private. Uh, but it does seem to me that the LBJ school can and ought to be able to take this into account. Um, and it's a, it's a really you know, tough sort of issue to think about fully. Can Harvard, and you know, Justice Powell went out of his way to praise the Harvard plan, which is quite problematic in many ways. But part of what Harvard wants to do is to be a great national university. And what it says is that we want to make sure that there are people from the upper Midwest uh, uh, at Harvard, and, uh, or from Alaska. And it turns out that's kind of disparate impact. It's going to favor whites overall. Um, is that legitimate or not? They're not consciously trying to favor whites, but to the extent they want to make sure there are people from the entire United States rather than simply uh, the metropolitan areas of the United States, that's going to have a racial or an ethnic tilt. Um, is that legitimate or not? Um, is it legitimate for universities to say we really want to be world universities and we want to be attentive to those groups who uh, are not really found much? Uh, at American universities, uh, you can frame this in terms of diversity. You know, uh, one of the things, one of the reasons I think that diversity um, analysis is kind of scandalous is that universities don't present fully fleshed out theories of what they mean by diversity. Um, I very much wish that the University of Texas had more foreign students than it has. I think it is scandalous the extent to which most Americans really have never been in contact um, uh, with Arabs, right, right, whether Muslim or Christian, living in a variety of Middle Eastern countries. I think it is terrible that the Texas legislature um, is really unsympathetic to more foreign students. Um, um, but that is going to have um, certain tilts to it. If you say, well, the market generates you know, a satisfactory number of people from Europe, but we want people elsewhere than Europe. Should a university be able to say things like that? Should a university be able to say, and this is another thing that is extremely important at temporary universities, how important should STEM be anyway? It is very clear at this university and at many universities um, that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are the only things that more and more people really care about. Well, what about the humanities? Um, should universities, I mean, it's interesting you say that, you know, somebody is going to be 
uh, frustrated in his dreams to be a doctor. And, I, and you know, I think you'd have to be quite callous not to be sympathetic to that. But what if people say, well, my real dream is to be a professor of Germanic languages, or my real dream is to study Renaissance literature. And should universities care about that? Should universities care about supplying an adequate student base to take courses in what used to be the heart of the university, that is the humanities courses? Um, it occurred to me in thinking about today, and for me this is a real question, it's not merely fake or rhetorical, uh, to what extent should universities care all that much about English literature, uh, where English literature means not, not only American literature, but you know, literature from the old country, from England. Uh, that represents a certain moment in American history where universities basically were controlled by, by wasps, which was the, the phrase I grew up with, white Anglo-Saxon <coughs> Protestants, many of whom could trace their heritage not only to Europe, but to England. Why should you care? You know, is it really important that anybody read Middlemarch, that there are courses on Shakespeare? Um, these are questions that really ought to be discussed more than they are. Um, but they but behind these are images of what you think universities are good for, what they ought to be about. Um, what questions can we ask? You know, should, we, should we ask applicants of universities what they intend to study? And should we say, well, we have enough engineers, or we have enough computer scientists. Uh, the daughter of a friend of ours probably got into Stanford in part because she said she wanted to major in English. Um, I suspect that Stanford could fill up its entire first year with valedictorians who want to be computer scientists. You know, what do we think about that? But these are questions I think that are addressed by the very real issue that you're spotting. And I don't mean to deny at all the reality and the anguish behind what you're talking about. My real question is whether judges have very much that's going to be useful really to say, whether it's based on the US Constitution or Texas Constitution, and really how we ought to navigate our way through these remarkable changes that are occurring in American society and society at large throughout the world and the conception of what we think universities are about in the 21st century. So I agree with Professor Levinson that it is very hard and there's no, probably no real right answer as to what should be the goal of a university. And I think there's going to be lots of different goals. Caltech is a famous example of one. They have race-blind admissions. Uh, they don't try to balance by sex. They just want really high achieving math and science people. And so you do have a very skewed, I think it's maybe 75% male, and uh, possibly more Asians than white students, I think maybe 30, 40% or more. Um, you have other universities uh, that want a little bit of everything. You know, Harvard, I think, probably uh, has many different goals. They want uh, smart, high achieving kids in all different disciplines, not just math and science. And they want people who you know, are from underprivileged background, but they also want super powerful, wealthy, connected people like Jared Kushner, who have uh, low SAT scores, but you know, connections and money, uh, that works. And should courts be dictating those policies? No, I don't think so, and I don't try to. I mean, I, I think when I first started thinking about this issue, you know, I may have had, you know, there was a sort of a gut sense of like, I, I try so hard at school, right? And but there's these fact, political factors outside of my control that I don't want to be subjected to. So I, I may have a previous, you know, version of my thinking. I probably would have just said, just go straight merit, you know, uh, uh, go by SAT scores and grades, and like that's it, you know, fair and objective. I, I've since come to think that it's just that there are so many different factors that are very difficult. But I do think one thing that courts can say. And one thing that I could say, and that all the Asian Americans in this room can say, is that of all the many, many possible missions of a university, 
one of the race should not be among the considerations. And the reason for that is that when you take it into consideration, you inflict harms based on race. Not just benefits, but there are harms based on race. So if Asians all wanted to be doctors, and Harvard said, look, we want this many science nerds in our school, we also want the artsy-fartsy, you know, whatever person, and the future president, and the good-looking, rich senator, whatever, and, they, and all the Asians happened to want to be the doctors, and they were limiting in that way, and it's like, well, yeah, our, our university is about more than just producing scientists and doctors. But when you add race to it, then it really becomes a question of, well, and this actually came out, when Students for Fair Admissions sued the Department of Education to get these documents uh, for a Freedom of Information Act request about Princeton, and uh, the quotes, you can find them in a BuzzFeed article, uh, and what the documents from these Princeton uh, people were saying is, this person fits the typical Asian profile, typical Asian pre-med. So I suppose what they were saying was, if this was a black student who had these kind of credentials and he wanted to be a doctor, that would be awesome, that would be great. We, we don't see anyone like that, or, or so few people with this kind of credentials. But because this kid's Asian, we don't want any more Asian doctors. So when you add race along with those other considerations, there's something uniquely repugnant and offensive about judging and categorizing people based on uh, that classification. We have a history of it going back to slavery, to segregation, which was finally destroyed by Brown v. Board of Education. And now we, we're faced with this question, and I think uh, one thing that we're starting to see people talk about is increasingly in our diverse society, how meaningful are these racial categories? In so, for example, Hispanic. Technically, you know how on the census, uh, it's first, what ethnicity are you, Hispanic or not Hispanic? Then what race are you, uh, black, white, Asian, Native, American? So it, where did that distinction come from? And a part of the history of that is the word Hispanic is actually describing people who come from Spanish-speaking countries. So if you're a white person from Spain and you speak Spanish, you can honestly say that you're Hispanic. And this category of Asian. Where did this category come from? Why are people who look like me in the same race in the Census Bureau uh, as someone from India? I can tell you that if you went to China and asked them, are you the same race as the people from India, they would say, what do you mean? <laughs> if you went to India, they'd say the same thing about the Chinese people. It's only in America because of the history of our immigration policies, the Chinese Exclusion Act, other immigration laws, that we kind of occupy the same slice in the social hierarchy and the same stereotypes and the same uh, cluster just based on how people were selected for entry into this country. But why do we want, why, how is that a valid way to classify people and to inflict harms on people, not just seeking benefits, but to inflict harms based on these categories. Uh, another dimension of this, uh, mixed race families are increasingly common. Uh, I knew someone who was a UT law grad, uh, and he just graduated recently, and we were talking about this issue, and he said, I'm Indian, my girlfriend is black, you know, we may get married someday, and if we have kids, how, how does affirmative action treat our family? Should my children get a benefit because they're black or a penalty because they're Asian? Uh, the judge I clerked for, Danny Box, in one of the opinions from Michigan uh, in the affirmative action case in, in 2014 that was decided by the Supreme Court, he raised the, the example. What if you had someone who was uh, white, Hispanic, and Chinese? Now, he, he didn't talk about this, but that, that is a real person he was thinking of. Uh, does that person get a penalty because they're Asian? A benefit because they're Hispanic or, uh, I guess, normal treatment because they're white. Uh, these are questions that are uncomfortable to ask, but uh, if, if, this is, if these policies are going to justify inflicting race-based harm on people, we have to certainly uh, be rigorous in defining you know, what exactly are the categories that we're using and, and how are we going to apply them fairly to people. Uh, a similar example, relatedly, uh, I'll tell another story. Uh, one of my classmates in high school, we were applying for college. Uh, he, he had an Irish last name. It began with an O and an apostrophe. <laughs> he looked white. And one day he wasn't in class. And then the next day when he came back, we said, hey, where were you? Uh, you weren't in class yesterday. And he said, well, uh, I got this all expense paid trip to visit a liberal arts college in the Northeast. I said, well, whoa, how'd you get that? He said, I'm Hispanic. You know, someone in my family, you know, my grandma or whatever, is Hispanic. Now, let's say he's telling the truth, okay? Because, I mean, there's plenty of people, I'm sure some of them are in this room right now, who uh, you know, may be part Hispanic, but 
their name uh, you know, sounds white and they look white and they can pass as white. Uh, does that person deserve to be classified as Hispanic and how much of a benefit should they get in uh, the admissions process? Um, you know, now that people have been talking about white nationalism a lot recently, this clip that I love uh, is an interview of a man named Craig Cobb, and he is a white nationalist and a white separatist. And he went on the Trisha show, and he gets a couple minutes to do his nonsense because he's a lonely old man with no friends, and this is how he gets attention. And then after that, she says, remember that when we made you take that DNA test? And so she pulls out the file and reads it off to him. He's 14% Sub-Saharan Africa. And the whole audience erupts in laughter. You can find this on YouTube. It's hilarious. It's great. Uh, and I think everyone understands that that clip is funny because race is so arbitrary. And in fact, uh, this person thought he hated these people when in fact that was who he was himself. But of course, doesn't that mean that he could truthfully claim the benefits of affirmative action by saying he's African American? Uh, and, and these um, issues of who can pass is what, you know, uh, I alluded, I talked about, you know, it, does it matter what your name is, right? Uh, on Slate, there was a recent article uh, by someone named Aaron Mack. His last name is M-A-K. He's Chinese. But when he was going through the application process, he figured it's close enough that maybe if I just, like, said I was white and made my application look white, it's ambiguous enough that they just accept that I was white. And so that's what he did in his application process. He says, uh, I purposely avoided taking Chinese. Uh, I didn't want to do ping pong. I avoided every activity that would be stereotypically associated, uh, stereotypically associated with my race, right? Playing piano and whatnot. I did artsy things. I you know, was interested in journalism. And yeah, I like, I like journalism. But I also did that because I knew I wanted to get into Yale. And I didn't want to be discriminated against. So he passed his wife. He got into Yale. And now he writes this article, now that this debate is coming up, and he says, you know, looking back, I'm ashamed of what I did. And I, I hate that the process made me do this. Now, he never said that he would have done it differently, because he wanted to go to Yale, and he, he went there, and he got a lot of benefits from it, and he enjoyed it. So he doesn't say, I wish I rejected Yale, but he says, I would have told my younger self, I understand that you want to go to Yale, and that's totally understandable, you know, as a son of immigrants, and you want, it, you want the best, but also, just know that you know, ten years or however many years later, when you graduate and you're writing for Slate, you're going to look back and you're going to think, "I'm a sellout." That's how he described himself. Uh, and you're starting to see other Asian Americans who uh, actually say, "Well, I, I, I kind of support affirmative action. I've always supported it, but I do think it's racist against me and Asians." And so, if it's going to continue on, we're going to have to address this problem. Uh, Professor Jeannie Sook Gerson from Harvard, uh, she's Korean. She wrote, wrote about this, and uh, going back to the point about the mixing with, you know, the other factors with race, and apparently the people who talked to her and ad admitted her to Harvard said, um, oh, you know, we're so excited that you're not like a typical Asian. You know, you're really good at, I don't know, talking to people or whatever, you know, you have other interests. And she's reflecting back, like, actually, there are a lot of things about me that are Asian. I just didn't present them to you because I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get in, but there's a lot of ways in which I do fit the stereotype, and it's kind of offensive that you're judging me based on uh, how, what you think about my people and just, uh, judging us to be undesirable based on those attributes. Um, so uh, all of this is to say that race is an arbitrary classification. It's banned by our Constitution, our precedent in Brown v. Board of Education, the Texas Constitution, which explicitly says no discrimination on the basis of race, equal treatment. So I think when you have the text and when you do have precedent and moral history behind it, uh, the Supreme Court should do the right thing, and uh, I'm not saying how a university needs to define its mission. I'm just saying of all the ways you could define it, take race out of it because it's banned by law and because it's wrong. Yeah, I would have, in fact, I, I did predict a number of years ago that what we do in affirmative action is actually what has been presented, which is simply the permeability of categories, that as there would be more um, intermarriage, there would be more opportunity on the census to define oneself as mixed or other, that these categories, which are arbitrary, would collapse. Um, they've not, but I think that the 
the examples presented are, are very real. Um, in these conversations, I often think back to June 1978, when the Supreme Court issued its Bakke decision. That Sunday, then Dean Guido Calabrese of the Yale Law School wrote an op-ed for the New York Times saying that he deeply regretted the fact that the liberals on the court did not focus very explicitly and exclusively on the treatment of African Americans. And of course, it took a civil war to make that term meaningful because Dred Scott held that there was no such thing as an African American uh, since Africans could not be part, anybody with African descent could not be part of the American political community and Native Americans, where Calabrese said these are the two groups with unique histories of systematic racist maltreatment and generally speaking we ought to recognize that it's a bad idea to take race into account in public policy. But these are the two great exceptions. We really should not ignore that aspect of our history, which Brown versus Board. I mean, Brown is close to one teachable opinion because it, Chase Justice Warren, in order to get a unanimous opinion, tells you nothing useful about American history. You have no idea why 17 states are segregating on grounds of race. You don't know there was a civil war. You don't know there was slavery. And you don't even know what Brown stands for. So that's 60 years after the Supreme Court is still at each other's throats, um, four to four to Anthony Kennedy, as to what exactly is the meaning of Brown. That's not what the Supreme Court said in what the, What the liberals did was to uphold a California plan that focused on um, Asian Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, and African Americans. And what Calabrese correctly said is that this is going to lead to real problems down the road uh, where one gets into contests about comparative victimization. Um, um, and the like. And I think that by and large she's right. And that is the world we live in. I am quite confident in defending affirmative action programs with regard to African Americans and Native Americans. I get considerably less confident with regard to you know, what you're talking about. But I do think that the problem with the colorblindness view, you know, you can never take race into account, is that it just ignores American history. It ignores white privilege. It ignores really the racialist aspect. Now, the response to this is there's always, also been terrible discrimination against Hispanics. Just talk about Korematsu with regard not to all Asian Americans, but to Japanese Americans. Um, and that's true. And so there is something arbitrary, which I'll freely confess about saying, well, yes, this is terrible. This is something that ought to be taught. We ought not ignore Korematsu. We ought not ignore all of the ways that Hispanics um, uh, were discriminated against. But there is this primal sin in American constitutionalism, which we still not work through. But as I say, thanks to the United States Supreme Court, that's not the path we chose. Thanks to the United States Supreme Court, we're forced to talk about diversity as the one and only 
legitimator for uh, taking race into account. And we have all sorts of conversations that are just very frustrating. Um, and lawyers contribute to this because we're forced to talk the way the Supreme Court says we should talk. Well, I just think I'll briefly respond. I think the reason I think the reason the Supreme Court went down the diversity path was because if you were gonna go off of who's the biggest historical victim, first of all you do have the trouble of everyone's playing the victimhood Olympics and at the end of the day like uh, who how do you define who's a victim? You know, I, I, we have Korematsu, we have this, and, and how do you how many points do you assign based on that? But also that the timeline issue, right? I mean, uh, at what point do you say the costs outweigh the benefits? Because I think everyone acknowledges, even supporters of affirmative action, you know, it's, it's not we didn't we, we didn't we wish we didn't have to do this because there are costs, but they feel it's necessary, right? And I guess you know, at what point do you cut it off? And so maybe what the Supreme Court was thinking was, well, if we do the diversity rationale, we can keep doing this for a thousand years. But of course, the problem there is that I mean, you're never going to get 100% mathematically beautiful, whatever you think the perfect ratio is, which, by the way, how do you define what's the correct ratio? I mean, Harvard says 17% Asians every year after year, 50% whites. They, they come up with their ratio, but as we're arguing in the Harvard lawsuit, that, that quota is racist. Why couldn't it be 50% Asian and 17% white, right? Like, how is, how is that? Their formula better for educational benefits than uh, some other formula, but you know under that system, then you could do it all forever and ever. So maybe that's both you know what they wanted, but also the danger of it, which is you know at what point do you say the cost is too much? All right, we have just a little bit of time for questions. Um, yeah. So from the perspective of an Asian, there seems to be no way to win in this affirmative action fight because. As soon as you get rid of race considerations in administrative uh, and admissions, there's a surge of Asian Americans in um, the student body, and certain segments of the population will see their, uh, their children left out of that, and then they'll push for admission standards that you know are more holistic um, and emphasize more things that favor their children, like leadership and whatnot. Um, so there really seems to be no way an Asian can win in this fight because as soon as you get rid of racial considerations, they shift the goalpost into what merit is. So my question for you, Mr. Liu, is what are your advocacy goals? Should you should we see um, affirmative action get overturned to make sure that the merit definitions that admission boards have is holistic and is is more racially neutral? Well, like I said, I think. Um it's hard for a court to define what is the proper mission of a university. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to be very narrow in what we're arguing for, which is just take the race out of it as a matter of law. I agree that you know people in California will all say that after they removed racial considerations by constitutional amendment, the number of Asians now does exceed the number of white students, but it's still harder to get in as an Asian than as a white student. If you check a different box, you get it more easily. But at least I think just as a matter of politics, once you look at the ratio, you figure, well, okay, you know, it, it's hard to say. It, it's, it's less objectionable, I guess, than if you were capped at 17% of like Harvard. Um, but so I, I agree, you, you're never gonna get rid of all of the problems, and I, I don't claim to be able to solve all of them. I'd just like to see one change in the law, which is to finally recognize that these policies do have they don't just produce benefits based on race, they impose harms based on race. And they call it, you know, strict, strict, strict scrutiny is the doctrine, you call it narrow tailoring or whatever, but those harms based on race cannot be justified. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a question primarily for Professor Levinson. Uh, in the Fisher case, I heard UT administrators uh, spent a lot of time talking about how important the special sauce of diversity is to enriching the educational environment at UT, which is important to uh, enhance its uh, reputation and its ranking uh, as a national university. <clears throat> Yet, in California, 20 years ago, uh, they eliminated all uh, sex, race, and ethnic-based preferences in admissions and as a result, the most selective of the campuses at the University of California, uh, Berkeley, UCLA, San Diego, 
to a lesser extent Irvine, are now uh, disproportionately Asian, yet those schools continue to be among the most highly ranked public universities in America, doing better than UT. So how is it that this special sauce, if it's so important, uh, isn't necessary or in California is doing well just on the basis of a meritocratic admission system? I don't know enough about UC, but, but I do know that after what, what Proposition 179, whatever it is, the one that, that abolished affirmative action there, um, or at Michigan, there were immediate declines in African American enrollment. And that was taken very seriously by. by people at Berkeley. I think the same thing is true at Michigan. Um, you know, I'm somebody who takes diversity arguments seriously. My objection to most universities is that they don't present really cogent diversity arguments. Um, because for me, diversity would include much more attentiveness to foreign students. And it would include an interest in luring um, more Arab Americans to the University of Texas and things like that. Um, I think that Texas has more to be ashamed about than California does in terms of its history with regard to both African Americans and Mexican Americans. Um, we are the school of sweat versus painter. Um, um, we were a slave state that seceded in order to preserve slavery. And you know, you, you raised the issue when, when the statute of limitations run out. Um, and this is my objection to Brown as an opinion, not as an outcome. Uh, that Jim Crow is the attempt to preserve as much of the racial subordination linked to chattel slavery as possible. And then you can link that to other uh, aspects of Jim Crow um, as well. Um, California has a different history, and maybe it has less to apologize for. Um, but it does seem to me that one does need to talk ultimately about specific universities, specific states, specific missions, rather than to pretend that there's something called the generic university that we can talk about very um, compellingly. Um, you know, does every university have to offer the, the same array of uh, disciplinary majors? Or could a university sensibly say, well, you know, at these branches we'll have departments of molecular chemistry, but at other departments we won't. You know, other schools we won't. This could have implications for who wishes to go where. I mean, Caltech is a really interesting example. MIT would be an interesting example. You don't go to Caltech if your real interest is Renaissance literature. Um, and, uh, but anyway, this isn't a fully satisfactory answer because I don't think there are fully satisfactory answers. We have time for maybe one more quick question. So how does this lawsuit with um, Harvard University and the University of Texas differ from past lawsuits um, affirming, you know, going about affirmative actions? The Supreme Court has already weighed in on multiple occasions. Sure. This issue. So the Harvard case focuses very specifically on Asian Americans. There's a 17% cap. That, that is actually perhaps uh, a different issue than meaning minimum quotas for certain other groups. There's very clear evidence that it's like 16%, 17, 18, year after year for like a decade. Uh, we see there's a cap on the number of Asians, and there's strong evidence to support that, that number would be different 
if you didn't use racial considerations. That's a quota. That's an outright quota, which is banned under Gratz. Uh, it's not holistic. It's not individualized. Now, they say it is, but we're going to look at the evidence, and we have evidence uh, through discovery, and they've been forced to turn over documents by the court, even though Harvard has spent a lot of money trying to, to not disclose it. The court has made them do it. So that that's going to come out in the litigation. You're going to see the numbers, and uh, the court will then be able to rule based on that. The Texas lawsuit is, there's a few differences. Number one, the system at issue when Fisher sued, uh, I believe was in 2008, so that it actually was the top 10% plan at that point. So uh, now the system is modified where it's uh, 70, I thought it was 75%, but it could be 65% of the classes through top you know, 7% or whatever, right? So they've restricted that. So a greater portion of the students who are incoming are admitted through this so-called holistic system that considers uh, racial factors. So it's just a different system. And the, tech, and the Fisher case very specifically said, we're not just giving you a blank check to do race however you want to do it. This needs to be revisited continuously, see the practices, see whether you still need to do this. Um, so that's just the way the, the opinion was written. And then of course this case is under the state constitution of Texas. And so uh, the te Texas has an equal rights amendment that it passed in 1972. It's different. There's a Texas Equal Protection Clause in the Bill of Rights, which is, uh, I guess we just call it Standard Equal Protection Clause. But then in 1972, they passed an Equal Rights Amendment, which protects on the basis of sex, race, uh, I think maybe nationality as well. And so what the Texas Supreme Court has said is that, and this is in the context of a sex discrimination ruling, but they said, the point of passing this amendment was to give greater protections than what existed before. Otherwise, they, the Texans literally voted on a law that did nothing. So if this just mirrors existing doctrine, it wouldn't do anything. And so uh, there, now there's language in precedent saying that you know, we're Texas, we interpret our constitutionally differently. So this that does bring into the federalism issue because when it was on the state level, this decision can take into consideration Texas' history and the climate here. Um, but you know, it's state law and there's a, a specific amendment that was designed to provide more protection than what the U.S. Supreme Court gave. Yeah, I can't forbear mentioning that the 10% plan was passed in order to increase the enrollment of African Americans and Mexican Americans at the University of Texas because of the factual existence of segregated schools and the <coughs> rational belief by the Texas legislature that one would in fact increase the number of enrollees if you adopted this plan. If in fact Texas had truly integrated schools, there would be very, very little political support for the 10% plan. That's not why it was passed. That's not why it's maintained. The paradox is that it's maintained in part because it's also turned out to be a big windfall uh, for white kids from West Texas who previously either didn't want to attend UT or didn't get in UT. So you have you know, an, a fascinating, strange bedfellows coalition. Um, but suburbanites of all races and ethnicities have reason to be wary of the 10% plan because there are all sorts of kids who graduate in the top 10% or top 12% who are excluded from UT because the way that the, you know, this system operates. I don't know how you factor that into the Texas Equal Rights Law because if you're looking at the explanation for the law, you cannot ignore the role that race plays. But then do you really want to go down that road and talk about the racialist consequences or the racialist sorts of incentives to pass certain sorts of, of policies. Right, we're out of time, so let's thank our speakers.